Hello everyone and welcome back to Age of Nagash which is a channel dedicated to Age of Sigma and in this video I'm very excited as we're going to be continuing our long in-depth series on the Ostrich Bone Reapers. If you're familiar with my army series you'll know that this is going to be like my Slaves of Darkness one, my Beast of Chaos one, my Night on and everything else like that which basically means that we are going to leave no stone unturned while reviewing the series and probably by the end of it it will be around 10 to 20 hours along and this is the first part and we'll be looking at the allegiance ability so obviously this video is not going to be about 20 hours long we'll see how it goes but what we'll be doing in this video like i mentioned it's the allegiance ability so we'll be looking at the main battle traits they get we'll then be looking at the command traits available to them and the artifacts of power and then the spell law plus we'll do the endless spells as well as it just feels like this is the best part to mention that we're talking about the spell law might as well talk about the endless spells they can cast as well. So what we'll be doing throughout this video is there'll be a picture that I've taken from my phone of the rules from the battle tome on one side of the screen and then we'll just have some artwork on the other side of the screen just so it doesn't seem so static to you guys. And when I read out these rules I'll then give you my thoughts and my opinions on them and how I think they are best used as I am building up an Ostrich Bone Reaper army and I do have some experience with them. What I will say as well if you're very new to the Ostrich Bone Reapers and you think, oh, who are they again? The last video I did of this series, which was the first video, was about all their lore. So you can go check that out so you can find out who they are. And then what I will also say is I have got a Why Play Ostrich Bone Reaper video up there as well on my channel, just in case you want to have a bit more motivation to find out if you really do want to play them before you go into this really long series. But with all that aside, last thing I just want to do before we get started is say a massive thank you to the lifeblood of my channel which is of course as always my patreons so to my beautiful morgas which are going to be sad mac jonathan h phil kern bleed red guys all of you are absolutely fantastic in my eyes and i can't thank you enough for the support you give me and then my great vampires which is me martin s rash t one david a and ronnie h and of course my necromancers which is jack l radiation riley aw77 dice sagas wolf nick michael dobby Quad, Cranky Womba, Christopher F, and Christopher C. So guys, thank you so much for your continued support. Right now, let's get on with the Ostrich Bone Reapers. So like I said, the first thing we're going to do is talk about the battle traits. So as you can see, we've got the battle traits on the left-hand side of the screen. And if you can't read it, don't worry, as I'll be reading it all out to you so you won't miss a thing. So feel free to get your paintbrushes out or get your hobby tools out to start building and painting your models while we go through this. So the first thing I'm going to be talking about is, like I said, the battle traits. And the first one we have got is Lords of the Ostrich Empire. So the supreme ruler of the Ostrich Bone Reapers is Nagash. At whose right hand stands Arkan the Black? And at whose left hand stands Catacross? So what this actually allows you to do this rule is you can include Nagash and or Arkan in an Ostrich Bone Reaper army even though they do not have the Ostrich Bone Reapers keyword on their war scroll. If you do so, they gain the Ostrich Bone Reaper keyword on their war scroll but you cannot include any mercenary units in your army so essentially this is just how in case you're wondering you've seen people take Nagash and Arkan the Black into a Ostrich Bone Reaper army this is how they just gain the keyword which is really good as we'll go into later as they know like all the spells and the spell laws and they can actually be really quite useful and it's quite a cheap way to be able to use their command abilities in here which we'll get to in a moment the caveat to this though means that you can't take mercenary units in your Ostrich Bone Reapers, your Ostrich Bone Reapers can't have allies anyway, so you may be thinking, oh, well, mercenaries might have been quite a good thing for them. In all honesty, I don't think mercenaries are particularly good. Maybe there's one example out there where they are, but I'm not really too fussed about them. So that is a fair enough trade for me to make. As I've often taken Arkan the Black in a Ostrich Bone Reaper army, so I think he can be a really useful and not too expensive in points either. And then we have the Ostrich Bone Reaper Legion. So Ostrich Bone Reaper warriors are organized into mighty legions that fight in their own unique ways. And if your army is an Ostrich Bone Reaper army, you can give it an Ostrich Bone Reaper Legion keyword from the list below. All Ostrich Bone Reaper units in your army gain that keyword and you can use the extra abilities listed for that Legion on the pages indicated. So essentially this just tells you how you can use sub allegiances in this army. I am actually going to be doing a video at some point soon explaining how sub allegiances work just for new people who are a bit unsure. So don't worry about that. If you are still unsure, go watch that video when it comes available. But essentially, it's just like you pick the Ostrich Bone Reapers as your army and then you can give them some extra rules by going one route for them, which is kind of like if you play 
Space Marines, as an example, if you're from 40k, there are different chapters. That's basically what the sub allegiances are like in this. And then the ones you have to choose from are going to be Mortis Praetorians, Petra Elite, Sadiac Lords, Ivory Host, Noel Murad, and Crematorians. And if a model has a Ostrich Bone Reaver Legion keyword on its War Scroll, it cannot gain one. This does not prevent you from including the unit in your army. So that's mainly at the moment things like Mortis Praetorians because we have Catacross and we also have Xantos as well who have those keywords and that really means that they play best in those but you can take them in the other ones still. So then going on to the next one which is Deathly Warrior. So Ostrich Bone Reefers are made more formidable by the presence of their lords and masters. Roll a dice each time you allocate a wound or mortal wound to a friendly unit that has the Hecatos keyword or is wholly within 6 inches of a friendly Mortec Hecatos or is wholly within 12 inches or a friendly Ostrich Bone Reaper hero on a 6 that wound or mortal wound is negated. So just to break that down a little bit just so you guys understand if you're quite new to the army as well is things like the Hecatos keyword is things like your Morgas or your like Immortus Guard or your Necropolis Stalkers, they have that keyword. And then if it's things like a Mortec Hecatus, that means it's like the leader of a like Mortec Guard unit or a Kavalos Death Riders unit as an example. That's what it is. And then obviously a yeah, Osher Spring Reaper Hero is pretty straightforward. It's just a hero HQ, whatever you want to call it. Okay, and then going on to the next ability, which is Ranks Unbroken by Descent. So, the soul crafting process grants the Ostrich Bone Reapers iron self-control with no room for any fear or doubt. Do not take Battleshock tests for friendly Ostrich Bone Reaper units. That may just seem like a, a quick short one. That's really important. It's honestly game-changing because there's times where obviously it all comes down to objective plays and it comes down to a lot of the time who has more models in the objective than the opponent. And when the opponent hits you so hard and you have like a big block of Mortec Guard as an example, that means that the block of 40 that might have taken, I don't know, 20 casualties, they're not going to have to do a battle test. It's just absolutely huge. Or if the enemy just tries to shoot you off some bits and goes, right, I don't know, you've got a unit of 10 Mortec Guard again as an example, and they do 8 shots to you and they kill 8 of your Mortec Guard, you've still got 2 there and then definitely not going to run away. So it's huge, and especially how some armies actually play into the whole Battleshock uh, phase, which is to try and really nuke you as much as they can. It's not going to do bugger all against you here, so it's generally a really, really good ability, and it saves you having to spend a command point, which you don't get command points anywhere in this army, which we're going to go into now. So you can't use Inspiring Presence. Luckily, don't have to <laughs> with this one, right? Okay, so then going on to the rest of this ability. So in addition... If your army is Ostrich Bone Reaper army, you cannot use command points. Instead, you use relentless discipline points at the start of each battle round, before determining who has the first turn. You receive one relentless discipline point for each friendly Ostrich Bone Reaper hero that is on the battlefield. You receive one additional relentless discipline point for each Warscroll battalion in your army, and each friendly liege that is on the battlefield and three additional relentless system points if Catacross is your general and is on the battlefield. Then roll a dice for each friendly Osterarch Bone Reaper unit on the battlefield, including heroes above. For each six, you receive one additional relentless discipline point. Relentless discipline points are used in the same manner as command abilities, but can only be used for command abilities that appear on War Scrolls that has the Osterarch Bone Reaper keyword. For Osherish Bone Reaper Legion command abilities, for the Unstoppable Advance command ability below. When you generate your Relentless System points at the start of the battle round, any that you had left over from the previous battle round are lost. So that was just a massive block of text we read through, so how does it all make sense? Essentially, you don't use command points in your army. Do you still generate command points? Yes, so if your opponent can steal them off you, they still can. But instead of using command points, you use relentless discipline points. What's the trade-off? Essentially, in your army, as you can see, there's so many different ways to get them. You will have more relentless discipline points than you will command points anyway. But the relentless discipline points, they tend to be spent on command abilities that aren't quite as good, but some of them can be. And they all get wiped out at the start of the next battle round, because at the start of the next battle round, you generate your next lot of relentless discipline points, depending on... How much of the criteria as we just read out what this also means as they're not command points 
and it says you can only use them for command abilities you have on one of the legions you have here or if it's going to be your generic one which is like extra movement we'll get to in a moment on software advance or if it's on a war scroll for one of your units what this means is that if you just think about it you've got no way to forward access of a re-roll charge by using a command point and you've got no way to do like re-roll ones to save by using a command point or re-roll ones to hit or another really good one which is just make a, a run roll a flat six so there is a trade-off here, but in all honesty, I think it's worth the trade-off for that one time you can't reroll that charge, you will be gutted if it's like you failed it on a two or something. And by the criteria that we talked about of how you actually get these relentless discipline points can really sort of focus on how you build your army. It can make some people take cash across just because he gets the extra free there, but because he's also a hero and a liege, he actually generates five relentless discipline points if he is your general. And of course, if you roll that dice for him, because he's a unit on your Shrush Bone Reapers and you get that six, he could have generated six <laughs> relentless discipline points by himself, but like an, a flat five regardless. This is also one of the reasons why when I tend to build my less, I may take at least just one liege caveat, or maybe two, one of them being Xantos, because they are lieges as well, so each one generates two relentless discipline points each and when we get to reviewing those units in a other video down the line you'll see that their command abilities are quite good as well so you really are going to be kind of splashing these relentless discipline points when it comes to spending them so it can be really good if you really try and build into it and it's one of the reasons sometimes where I go maybe I think I can get away with a couple of heroes or something in my army but it's like no I actually really want to get those relentless discipline points so I may just like shuffle some things around chuck in an extra two heroes just to really play on it and it means that if you feel like, poor, I've got loads of units in my army, I don't know, that's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, because remember, as soon as you have at least six units in your army, that's like at least one relentless discipline point you should get on the average, even if you have 12 units in your army, as an example, which is a lot of units. But then that's two on the average. I've had it, though, when, you know, I've got, I don't know, 10 units in my army, and I haven't got any relentless discipline points by rolling those sixes. And then suddenly, two turns later, without getting any, I will roll my dice and I'll get like five sixes and it's just like boom okay this turn things are really gonna happen so yeah there's definitely a lot of play to build into here and also can be a reason why you take battalions remember because when most people take battalions in Age of Sigma you'll get that extra command point that command point to you is useless right so it's not really gonna help you out so it's a good thing it still gives you that one relentless discipline point as it's like a nice way to kind of give you like compensation if you know what i mean sounds a bit funny but it's like um, a nice way to still feel like you're getting that benefit from taking a battalion okay so then going on to the next thing which was the uh, inbuilt command vehicle you get for just being ostrich bone reapers which is unstoppable advance so ostrich bone reapers advance upon the foe at a remorseless pace you can use this command ability in your movement phase if you do so pick one friendly unit that has the Hecatos keyword, or is wholly within six inches of a friendly Mortec Hecatos, or is wholly within 12 inches of a friendly Osterich Bone Reaper hero. Add three to that unit's move characteristic in that phase. It can still run or charge if it does not run. You cannot pick the same unit to benefit from this command ability more than once per phase. So this is a fantastic command ability. It's something that I've used probably every turn when I play as Ostrich Bone Reapers as it really does make a huge impact in the game because as I've always said this is a game about movement and this is a bloody good command ability especially when you can't make flat sixes to run so you really need some help here and when you look at Ostrich Bone Reapers if you're very new to them or you're going to go against them you haven't really looked into them you may think they're a bit of a slow army right they're all a bunch of skeletons apart from maybe the ones on horses this shows that actually they're quite fast because your normal Mortec Guard who move four inches, chuck this on them, now they're moving seven inches standard and then if you want to run them then obviously you know the low average on a run would be a three and then that's actually some skeletons moving ten inches or if you charge them you can then move them obviously potentially uh, up to 19 inches but if you go something like Salek Lords which is one of the sub allegiances we'll get to in the next video but what they essentially let you to do is run and charge now you're really talking of how fast you can move and we're just talking about the slowest unit here that moves four inches put this on death riders or something and then they'll move a flat 15 before they decide to run or charge so you can do loads of things with it it's really useful and as you can see the holy within ranges of who you need to be to get this ability are the same for the deathless warrior so you can see that 
Some obviously ranges you need to measure in your army to get buffs are different, but a fair few of them are the same, so it's not too hard to remember. A little tip for you is for your Mortec Hectus, is what you want to do is put him in the middle of the units. This is like the champion for your Mortec Guard or the champion for your uh, Kavalos Death Riders. Put them in the middle of the unit so they can make sure all the other models from that unit are going to be wholly within the 6 inch range of him. And then that is what I think is really what helps out the Ultra Spring Reapers. It gets you on those objectives early. It can really help you out late game as well. And you don't rely on your heroes to have to be nearby. So when it all comes down to turn four, turn five, you may not have even any heroes left, but you have some Cadillac Death Riders, for example, they can start zooming across the board. And I've done that in multiple games and it's helped me win those games. So it's absolutely fantastic command ability. Really cannot recommend using it enough. And don't forget about it because it's on this page on your battle traits, in your book, and it's not on a war scroll of a unit you're taking in your army, don't forget about it. Make sure you remember this because it's going to really help you out when you need it. There are other ways to buff your movement in this army, which we talked about, to get you across the board, and this really is a great way to complement it. It's almost a center point. So anyway, with that, we then move on to the last bit on this page, which is the design and note, which is many Ostrich Bone Reaper command abilities do not require a hero to be nearby in order for you to use it. These command abilities represent the orders issued by the leader of the unit. In addition, some abilities allow you to return same models to a unit. When you do so, set up models one at a time within one inch of a model from the unit they are returning to. This can be a model returned earlier in the phase. Returning models can only be set up within three inches of an enemy unit if any models from that unit they are returning to are already within three inches of that enemy unit. Okay, so that last bit there may just seem like a bit of a, oh, where did that come from? We haven't talked about anything about returning models or, you know, uh, healing things, essentially. This is going to be useful later when we look at things like, I don't know, Arcan or the Bone Shaper and stuff. When we get to that, when we review those units in their War Scrolls, just bear what I just read out in mind that you can't basically, when you bring back models, tag enemy units into combat is essentially what that's going to be. And it's also just adding the fact going, I can use command abilities without a hero being nearby, which we just talked about. Yes, you can. It's written there just in case anyone was wondering like, oh, is that the intention? Yeah, it is. So it's great and it's really solid. So now we're gonna go into the command traits. So we've got two different tables here, as you can see on the screen. And we've got one for your leech caveats, and then we've got one for your mortar sounds, which to be honest, are really your two any hero choices for the army without including named characters because they can't take command traits. So these are very specific where we look at command traits and other armies we go well it depends who you put on on this literally the leech caveos is the guy on the horse that hero and it's like these can only go on him so if they're not good for him they're not good at all the other thing i will say about these command traits is because the sub allegiances which we'll go into in the next video so we're not going to really talk about them here but they are generally quite good and in those sub allegiances you get given a command trait that you have to take and as you can only take one you can't pick one from here so you don't often see these because most people go for the sub allegiances, but that also makes it more interesting to read through them. And we're going to start the Liege Caveos command traits. And the first one we're going to look at is Ancient Knowledge. So this commander has studied the ways of war for a millennia. You receive one additional Relentless Discipline point at the start of the battle round if this general is on the battlefield. Okay, so that's quite interesting. I'll tell you for why. Because like we've already just mentioned, you're going to get one because you're a hero, because he's a leech. You're going to get another one, and then because he's got this command trait, Ancient Knowledge, you're going to get a third one. So that's three Relentless System points just from this guy alone. And who knows, when you roll a dice for him, because he's one of your Osrush Bone Reaper units in your army, of course, you may roll a six, so who knows, so he could generate up to four command points by himself. So that could be quite funny. So yeah, that's not too bad, that's all right. And then at number two, we have Immortal Ruler. So it is not impossible to extinguish the soul of this commander. The Deathless Warrior's battle trait negates a wound or mortal wound allocated to this general on a roll of a 5 plus instead of a 6. So basically it just means you've got that death save on a 5 and a 6. Um, I mean it's good but I, I wouldn't take it just because you've already got that 6 up. To be fair you've already got a 3 up save so this would just be a make your guy that much harder to kill. But if he didn't have a six up already then it would be good but as he's got one it's, it's not really too good and then you've got number three dark acolyte so this commander has learned how to master the power of magic this general is a wizard that knows one spell from the law of the mortisans 
they can attempt to cast that spell in your hero phase and attempt to unbind one spell in the enemy hero phase. Okay, so just to remind you that this is for the Liege Caviosis, so they're not wizards anyway. So they get one spell. Um, the problem is you're probably already going to be taking Mortisans, who are like your spell casters for Ostrich Bone Reapers, which we talked about in the Lord video. You are going to be taking them in your army anyway, more than likely. So yeah, I think Dark Acolyte isn't great. I mean, it's an extra spell caster and it's an extra unbind. But yeah, it's not. You're, when you're looking at taking one of these, like I already mentioned, you're going to be giving up a sub allegiance, and that is not worth giving up one of the sub allegiances. So, going on to number four, we've got Peerless Warrior. So, if the unmodified wound roll for an attack made by a melee weapon by this general is a six, that attack inflicts one mortal wound on the target in addition to any normal damage. Again, it's quite mediocre, it's not very really good. I mean, I've used this on. When I look at my Slaves of Darkness and I go Ravengers and I can pick so many command traits, I have one I believe that's similar to this. And it's yeah, it can it can help, but like it's not gonna be great. I mean, what you've got your most attacks is the uh Kavios himself, which is the horse, uh this big skeletal steed. That's not gonna get it because it won't benefit from the command trait, because it is a mount, yeah. So I'm not a massive fan of that as well. The number five, we've got hatred of the living. So the Lords of Undeath loathes all civilization. Add one to hit rolls for attacks made with many weapons by this general and their mount. So it's cool that it actually states that, like I just mentioned from the last one. So you get to add one to your hit rolls if the target is not a death keyword. Now, I was gonna say, if you go to a tournament, let's just say as an example, currently most armies out there aren't death. They're either order or chaos, and they're mainly order. So you've got a good chance of making the most of this ability. But what I will say is that there are actually other ways to get add one to hit rolls in Ostrich Bone Reapers. One of them is like the Bone Tie Shrieker, which is the endless spell of like the four skulls on that diamond as well, and like that bloody trail that's trailing behind it. And that's going to give you a plus one to hit. And that's something that I almost see as a bit of an auto include to take when I take Ostrich Bone Reapers. So I may just be doubling up on this ability when I don't really need to, and I could go for something else. The thing with Ostrich Bone Reapers is that you're hitting, you can make very good. You can easily make a lot of your hit rolls hitting on twos. Because this guy, for example, the Luge Caviar, is already hitting on threes. So you take this, hitting on twos. So getting that extra plus one to hit via this command trait or by being in range of that endless spell, you can't hit on ones. Well, you can, but you, ones will always fail. So unless the enemy's making you minus one to hit, you're not going to see the use of it. The problem the Ostrich Bone Reapers have in the Hissons Wounding Department is definitely in the wounding bit. So if this was plus one to wound rolls, I would definitely be a fan of it because that would definitely see more use of it. But anyway, so that is that. And then number six, we've got Life Stealer. So at the end of the combat phase, if any enemy models were slain by wounds inflicted by this general attacks, that combat phase, you can heal up to D3 wounds allocated to this general. Now, I quite like this because you have a fair amount of healing in your army, particularly if you go for like Arcan in your list as well, and he can heal up to like four Oshrach Bone Reaper units that are in range of him. He can heal them up in your hero phase, D3 wounds. So you've got that going on, and you've got this guy going on. That's two D3 wounds you're healing. This guy, like we said, has got that three up save. He's got that six up after save. He can be even more tough than that if you want to try and increase his saving. Like, you know, Mystic Shield as an example, that's a reroll ones, or there's other things you can do. So I think Life Stealer and looking at all of them, Life Stealer and Ancient Knowledge are my two favourite ones out of them. But if you were to ask me, are they better than going for a sub allegiance? I would say no. Again, we'll look at the sub allegiances in the next video, but they're not they're not awful, but it's just I suppose you want to really go be a bit different because you don't have to take a sub allegiance in this book, like we've mentioned. It's not one of those books that's like you have to take a sub allegiance, like Slaves of Darkness, for example, is not like that. So if you want to be different, you know, you can do this. And those would be my two best picks from this list that we have available for those Liege Caviosses because Liege Caviosses, like I said, are almost as icy and auto including your army unless you really low on points because they have a really good command ability and they just give you those relentless discipline points really easily. So then we're going to look at the Mortisan qualities. So this is for obviously your Mortisans, and that's keyword Mortisans. So that can be for any of your Mortisan heroes, which are obviously, like I mentioned, the Wizards. And that's going to be like your Mortisan Soul Mason. It's going to be your Mortisan Bone Shaper and your Mortisan Soul Reaper. We did talk about it in the lore video. We're not going to go into their rules just yet. 
because we're going to cover that when we cover them in a future video as part of this series when we review those war scrolls. But those are the three units that can take a command trait from this table. So unlike when we talked about the Leech Caviosus one, it's just that one war scroll, that one model that can take it. Xantos can't, although he's made up the same kit, because despite being a Leech Caviosus, he is a named character. But anyway, going on with the Mortal Sand command traits. So the first two are actually going to be the same for the Liege Caveos, so that's going to be the Ancient Knowledge to get that additional Relentless Discipline point. And then we've got a Mortal Ruler to make your 6-up death save a 5-up death save. So, okay, so rather than me just saying they're the same, how do they imply for the Mortar Sands? I suppose Ancient Knowledge is useful because if you're going to go Mortar Sand heavy, then you might not have a Liege Caveos, which then means that you're going to get that additional relentless discipline points so then it's kind of getting the same points as a normal leech caveos but i don't really think it works like that how i run my list anyway if i'm taking a mortisan so one of the wizards i'm probably taking a leech caveos anyway so yeah i mean it's not as useful and then when we go on to the immortal rulers for that five up save is good but you know if this guy's taking damage you're in trouble so i wouldn't really bank too much into that basket and then going into number three which is different though we've got dire ultimatum so this pitiless ruler makes impossible demands of their victims on pain of death. Subtract so two from the bravery characteristics of enemy units while they are within 12 inches of this general. Now that's something that you can really quite stack on easily because like I said that bone tie shrieker spell as just one of the examples you can make the enemy minus one bravery in this army and like I said I do try to take it a fair bit. That means you can make the enemy easily minus three bravery if they're in range of your general which is a mortar sandwich again you know they're not the most survivable guys so i don't know how close you want to get them to the enemy but there you go that could be minus three you take some more gas in your army as well harbingers or archai the enemy are going to be another minus one so that could be like an easy minus four bravery you could do but then again you could go against bone reapers and it means absolutely fuck all or you could go again to gloom spike gets for example and they can just do inspiring presence all day long so Battle Shock is not as important as it was, but as it hasn't been very important for a while, because so many arms have ways to get around it, I think it will at one point. But Battle Shock will always catch you off guard if you play with an army that can't avoid it. And when I say if you play with an army that can't avoid it, I mean pretty much all of them from Battle Shock Bone Reapers. So, yeah, it could, it could be useful. Um, it's, it's minus two bravery, right? It's not these stupid ones that are like minus one. It's like just a waste of time writing that. Okay, and then number four, we've got Grave Sand Bones. So the wizard is constructed from the bones that is heavy with the magic of Shaish. The general knows one extra spell from the law of the Mortisans. I mean, that could be useful, but what I will say there is like, if you really want to have a wizard that knows loads of spells, just take Arcan. Like, rather than investing so much into this, unless you just want like a cheap two caster, you could do. Or like, it's not even like a two caster, it's just one extra spell. So, so what I would say is that the Soul Reaper and the Bone Shaper, again, we'll look at their War Scrolls in another video. Their spells they have on their War Scrolls are not very good, but they can already pick one from the law, and they're only a one-cast wizard, so that's that sorted. And then the Soul Masons, they can cast two spells, and they get to pick one from the law. So you can go, oh, cast two spells? Maybe I should allow him to pick two spells from the law, and then I'm getting the most out of him. His War Scroll spell is actually pretty good to reroll ones to hit which is useful especially on catapults or in combat so you're going to be casting that anyway and then of course you've got things like mystic shield and endow arcane bolt so yeah i wouldn't say that's useful uh, in most cases and then number five we've got oathbreaker curse so woe betide any who break a contract brokered by this general so roll a dice each time your opponent receives a command point while this general was on the battlefield. On a roll of a six, that command point is lost. I like it because I think it's funny trying to steal enemy command points because sometimes by stealing that one command point with a whole strategy it's based around, they are going to be pretty goddamn annoyed. But the problem is, where you see this artifact in a lot of our books, or command trait even, it will be you steal their command point, as an example, on a roll of a six. You're not going to do anything with their command point, and you don't even get it anyway. You're just going to take it away from them. And the fact that it's only on a roll of six doesn't even mean you're guaranteed to get it off once per game. So, yeah, not a fan of that. And then number six is Soul Energy. So, you can reroll casting and dispelling and unbinding rolls to this general. If you do so, the general suffers one mortal wound after the effects of that spell, if any, 
I'll carry it out. I was about to say, Sun Energy, that's pretty cool. I like that. I mean, we'll read the law, shall we, just to try and big it up. So, uh, this wizard can draw on the power of their own soul when they use the arcane arts. Let's try and make it sound a bit cooler, because personally, I don't like that at all. Because, like I said, it sounded pretty good. And then you take a mortal wound at the end of it. Again, you can heal in this army. I get it. So, you know, it might not be that big of a thing. But you're taking one of these. It's denying a sub allegiance, which are really big in this book. And I've really mentioned that. So these needs to be really punchy. And I have to just say, for the more sands, I'm just not feeling it. The leech caveats is even. Like, there's a couple. Like, you've got the ancient knowledge and then you've got the life stealer. Which I like, but in a sort of summary of how I think, and again, you know, you take whatever you want and how you want to play your games, but I do tend to look at things as like a more competitive point of view, and I can't honestly say these are better than choosing a sub allegiance, you know, be cool and different, they're better. You can still be cool and different if you want, but I'm just saying they're not going to be better for you. But we're going to go into the sub allegiances in the next video, guys. So, you know, if you want to hear my thoughts on them, just tune in next time and we'll get that done. But those are the command traits. Not awful, but... They don't um, outshine the sub allegiances as a summary. But then when we move on to the artifacts that you should be able to see on your screen now, the artifacts of power, these are interesting because the battalions within this book, the Ostrich Bone Reaper Battle Tome, are fairly easy to take. And also there is the Broken Realms Techless book coming out. And I don't know when it's coming out, guys, at this moment of recording. However, it's coming out some point soon. I'm pretty sure they said there are new battalions for Ostrich Bone Reapers in there. So there's even more choices of battalions. And they're all quite fairly easy to take in your army. They don't cost too many points. So what I'm trying to explain to you is that you'll have a fair good chance of being able to take a second artifact, maybe even two extra artifacts, because you've got those extra battalions in your army. And what that means is that unlike the command traits, where it's like, well, you're going to sub allegiance, you get the command trait from that sub allegiance, and that's the end of it. You don't get another one. But the artifacts, obviously... With how many extra battalions you get in your army, you have an extra artifact for each one. So there's a good chance you'll be able to take two or more artifacts in your army. So it's actually important to read through these as you may be taking them. So then going on to the first one. So again, these are going to be for the Liege Caviosses. And then the next ones are for the Mortisan Bone Shaper, which you're going to have a choice of three out of. And then after that, you can't see it on the screen now, but after that, we're going to have a look at the Mortisan Soul Mason and the Mortisan Soul Reaper. So instead of them just going, these are for Mortisans, they've really tried to style it to the three different Mortisan uh, choices, which I think is quite cool. But anyway, going on the Liege Caviosses first. So the first one is going to be a Mind Blade. So a shimmering blade that emits a thin scream when it is drawn. The mind blade can sever the intellect from those whose flesh is cut. So you pick one of the bearer's melee weapons. If the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with that weapon that targets a hero is a six, your opponent loses one command point to a minimum of zero, and that hero cannot use command abilities for the rest of the battle. I personally I love this, right? I'm not saying it's the best one out of the ones we've got here, and I will go through them all and we will discuss that, but straight away love this. If you put this on a uh, Achillean King, if you manage to do this to Voltaurus, something like that, and the best thing is, if the unmodified hit roll for a tank made with a weapon that targets a hero is a six, they lose their command point, and then they can't use those command abilities for the rest of the battle. You don't even have to wound them. You don't even have to cause damage. It's just the hit. I really like that. Um, like if I was taking a battalion, I, this would be a strong contender just because there's so many armies out there that just rely on like one stacking command ability as an example. Like I said, the Achillean King or Voltaurus from the Iden of Deepkin. Or even like Archaon has a great command ability. Nagash, there's so many out there that this would just bugger up their day. And that's why I really like it. And it's really quite different. We don't really see much like that in the game. But anyway, going on to number two, we have Lawley Phylactyly. So this phylactery, honestly, I really hate pronouncing that word. I don't know if I'm doing it right. But anyway, it harbors a vast amount of soul energy, granting the bearer the authority of 10 lesser commanders. So once per battle at the start of any phase, the bearer can use his artifact. When they do so, you receive D3 relentless discipline points. Okay, so that could be very useful because sometimes it might be about turn two, turn three even. You may have lost a hero. You might have lost a couple of units. You're not getting as many discipline points anymore and you really need them. So this is just another great way just to boost it. Yeah, it's only once per battle. It's only going to help you out for one battle round, but you can do it at any phase. So 
it does give you some flexibility there, so I do like that. And then you've got number three, scroll of command, which is subtract two from the bearer characteristics of enemy units while they are within six inches of the bearer. See, that's quite good if you really wanted to do the bravery bomb, right? I mean, you've got like Mortis Praetorians that make the enemy minus one. And then you've got the Bone Tie Shrieker, which is another example to make the enemy minus one. And then you've got Morgas as well that make the enemy minus one. So that is already a minus three if you were Mortis Praetorians and you took this as an artifact. You could make, you could stack. Or if you wanted to, again, be different, you could go with the uh, Mortis and Qualities, which you talked about their command traits. Go with Dire Ultimatum, makes the enemy minus two as well. Minus two from this artifact, that's minus four. Take a Morgast, you know that's minus five. Take the Bone Tide Shrieker, that's minus six bravery. So again, it just shows how you can easily really stack that if you would like to. And then going into my lucky number, number four, we have got the Gravesand Bone Plate. So this armor emits an aura of morbid energy that can age nearby mortals decades and mere moments. At the end of the combat phase, roll a dice for each enemy unit within 3 inches. On a 4 plus, that unit suffers 1 mortal wound. Absolutely fucking pointless. Why do they even write this? Right, going on to that. That was my lucky number as well. And it's just, they're just so boring. I mean, you might go, oh, this 1 mortal wound wiped out an enemy hero that then allowed me to have that objective and it was all worth it and it you know, won me the game right tell me about those examples in the comments because i every battle tome has these artifacts and everything and they're just absolutely pointless why have i even read it why have i even spent this much time talking about it sorry for wasting your time then going on to number five we have marrow pack so the glyphs born to war by this liege blind those who view them in arcane packs that siphon the energy from their bone marrow. So once per battle in your hero phase, pick one enemy unit within six inches of the bearer that is visible to them and roll a dice on a three plus that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds and you can heal one wound allocated to the bearer for each mortal wound that is inflicted and not negated. I mean, that's quite good. It's a way to heal, but the terrible thing about it is it's once per battle, which is never a great way to start an ability. And then you get it on a free up, so it's not even guaranteed, and then it has D3 mortal wounds. If it was D6 mortal wounds, I'd be like, it's alright, but it's not great, but D3 on a free up, and you get to heal a wound? Absolutely no chance am I going to take that. Right, okay, number six, so we had two bad ones, can we get a good one? We've got Helm of Ordinate, so this helmet radiates the wearer's will into nearby constructs, and it's add one to hit rolls for attacks made by friendly Ostrich Bone Reaper units and their mount while they are wholly within 12 inches of the bearer. And yes we can, this is a good one and this is actually my favourite one for all the artefacts for the Liege Caviar is just because it's great because you add him onto hit rolls and that's including himself so when you look at the bloody command trait that was like add him onto hit rolls so you're not going against death, right just take this and it's so much better and you get it to the rest of your army as well and there's more chance you can take this because you can still take a sub allegiance, take a battalion and you get this as well also, it's going to help if you want to go, let's say, an all-mounted army. You could have him run along, making your uh, Cavalos Death Riders hit a lot better. But even with, like, if you've got them stand behind blocks of mortar, you're going to help that. Or even if you want to go with Stalkers or Morgas, you can really lean into this. And it's just flexible for the whole army, which I really, really, really do like. The other thing I will say about this as well is that you could go, well, the Bone Tide Shrieker helps with that, doesn't it? Like I said, yeah, it does the plus one. But this is really good because you can't always rely on that bone tie shrieker right if you go against i don't know croak or something you're gonna have a tough time getting that thing off so this is really good and that is why i think it is the best one out of all the artifacts of the leech cavalosis second to the first one which was the mind blade because if you can get it off in the right situation absolutely fantastic you know who knows it could win you the game on that alone but those situations may not always come up in your best case scenario but the Helm of the Ordained is always going to be useful and it's absolutely great. I think that is the best one, like I said, out of all of them. And I'm really happy that's like a nice way to finish them off. So then when we go on to the Mortar Sands, well, the first one's going to be the Bone Shaper. Looking at the tools of the Bone Shaper. So the first artifact of power is the Artisan's Key. This Bone Shaper is gifted indeed. So much so he can be given the Artisan's Key, a relic that bolsters his ability to shape and heal constructs. So before you use the bearer's bone shaper ability, roll a dice. On a four plus, you can either pick two units within six inches of the bearer, 
to be affected by the bone shaper ability instead of one, or you can pick one unit within six inches of the bearer to be affected by the bone shaper ability twice. So that is really good. If you're wondering what that does, essentially, like say we're going to the water scroll later, but it allows you to heal three wounds back up or three wounds worth of models. Now it could be, you know, six wounds worth of models, or it could be just six wounds to one of your like one model units, or you know, something that has multiple wounds. So it is pretty good because you can make things very survivable in this army, and there's obviously other ways to heal them. If you've got Arcan in your army as well, that's an other D3 you could heal. So you could really stack it up if you've got things like a Harvester, and it's all about a Mortec block unit, you can really use this as well to help. However, it relies on that 4-up, which like the other artifacts we looked at lately that rely on a 3-up or a 4-up, it's not guaranteed, right? And therefore, I don't like it. And you could go like, oh, it's still good though, because it's still 50-50 chance of you getting it. Yeah, it is, but there are better artifacts to take. So yeah, it doesn't win that spot there. Then going into the load of saturation. So this ignorant of Nagarai Iron Alloy, when pressed against a bone construct, renders its structure nigh invulnerable. So at the start of your hero phase, pick one friendly ostrich bone reaper unit other than the bearer, that's within one inch of them, until your next hero phase, the deathless warrior's a battle tree, negates wounds and mortal wounds allocated to that unit on a five up instead of a six up. So you could put this on a big block of mortar guard and make them even more survivable, or you could do that as well. The thing I like about this is you're not rolling a bloody dice either to try and get a four up to do it. So it's just a guaranteed, but you do need to be close to those units. But as you're going to be trying to heal them up anyway, if you've got that bone shaper, you're going to be close. So yeah, that's all right. Um, right, and then going on to the next one, which is the final one. The third one is going to be the Crafter Gem. So this triad of cut black gems allows the bearer to siphon the energies of resurrection from each stone at the same time healing his physical incarnation with incredible swiftness. So in your hero phase, you can heal up to three wounds allocated to the bearer. Once the total of wounds this artifact has been used to heal during the battle equals to three, it cannot be used again for the rest of the battle. So let me just reread that quickly in my head. So you can heal up to three wounds. And when it's been used to heal three wounds, it can't be used. Okay, so that's basically, you can keep on using it. So let's say he's taking one damage, use it just to heal up so he's back onto full health. And then the next turn, you're healing him up two wounds that he's taken, and then that's three. And then it's like, it can't be used the rest of the battle. Don't like it at all. I mean, you can keep your Bone Shaper alive, but it's not as good as the other artifacts. So for the Mortar and Bone Shaper artifacts, I would say the favorite one is the Load or Saturation, just to make your other units more survivable. The Bone Shaper is a support construct. He is literally there to help out the rest of your army. He's not there to try and stay alive himself. So that's why I think that given a other unit that five up wound or mortal wound save is the best thing out of the three. But I'm still preferring if you've got a Leech Caveos in your army, obviously, the Helm of Ordained. But if you're not and you're going for a Bone Shaper, you want to get the Bone Shaper sank, the Lord of Saturation is my favourite. Then swiftly moving on to the Treasures of the Soul Mason. So this is for Mortal Sands Soul Masons only, and the first one we're going to look at is a Gothazar Cartouche. Inscribed by Nagash himself, this Cartouche is made from the bones of a fallen Chaos Lord. It is an emblem of the hatred the dead have for the living, and stokes their desire for revenge against those who still remain vital. So add one to the wound rolls for attacks made with many weapons used by death units while wholly within 9 inches of the bearer if the target does not have the death keyword. Now I actually really like this as I already mentioned that the wounding is the thing that the Ostrich Bone Reapers will struggle at when it comes to hitting or wounding. Wounding is definitely the one that they will struggle at. So this really does solve it because you can make your Mortec Guard for example, you know, like they're hitting on 2s and then it's they're wounding on 4s. And it's like, you can make them like hitting on twos, rerolling ones, right? And then wounding on fours, it's like you're just going to lose so many of those attacks. So adding one to the wound rolls could be really, really good. The only problem here is it's not even that it has to be against something that's not death, because I'm not really too worried about that. If you go against the death army, well, you know, tough shit. But the problem is, is it's wholly over nine inches. Your mortars and soul masons only have a five up save. They're not particularly survivable. They're not the worst thing. They're not a grot or anything, but... They're not very survivable. You don't really want to have them too close up. So it's quite a risky strategy. 
But it, I think something that's worth trying out. I personally haven't tried this out at this moment in time. By the time you're listening to this, maybe I have. And maybe I'll put some comments down below how I think it worked. But I think this has got some play. I just think it needs a bit of testing just to see if your Soul Mason is a bit too vulnerable to be the one who has this put upon them. So then going on to the Soul Reserver. So this vile like artifact is honeycombed with dozens of tiny components, each a prison in which a captive soul can be stored, granted the owner a tremendous supply of energy with which to empower his spells. Add two to the cast and roll for the bearer. However, if the cast and roll for the bearer is an unmodified 10 plus, this artifact cannot be used for the rest of the battle. I still like that. Yep, sure, you might not be able to use the artifact for the rest of the battle if you get, you know, roll a 10 on your dice. The odds are going to be in your favour to not roll that unmodified 10, but even if you do, you still got that add 2 to cast in for maybe when you needed it. So it could have already done enough to help you by the point of the battle where you've lost it. Don't get me wrong, if you go, oh, there's not really much to cast on turn 1, I might as well do a Mystic Shield, and then you get your unmodified 10 then, or above, then yeah, that kind of sucks because you just wasted it. Then going on to number 3, we have Throne of Zent, I'm going to pronounce that as, uh, crafted by... Jazent, one of the first soul masons, this rune has a fierce animus that has seen it stained by the gore of countless battles. Add two to the bearer's wound characteristics and add two to the attack characteristics of the ossified claws of the bearer's mount. I mean, that's alright to be honest because you're making him more survivable. Like we said, he's not the most survivable guy. But the reason why I'd want him survivable is so he can make the most of that Gothazar artifact for number one. Because he he can't, and to be fair, his claws have managed to kill some things to me, but I think that's more a case of me being lucky and my opponent being unlucky, because they're nothing really to write home about. So, yeah, I kind of like that if they add two to the wound characteristics. It's not really the strongest reason. So out of those three, it's definitely the Gothsar cartouche is my favourite one. Uh, just, yeah, because you're adding one to the wound roll, which is something that you're going to suffer from in your Shrek's Bone Reaper army, but the range and how close proximity is going to be to help out your units is a problem. Right, then going on to the next table, which is going to be for the Soul Reaper, and this is going to be Weapons of the Soul Reaper. So, number one, Lunith Scythe. This legendary artifact was made in the lightless depths of the Shaishan Nedra. It cuts away daylight itself, casting pools of purple black energy across the battlefield with each killing swipe. Subtract one from hit rolls for attacks that target the bearer. In addition, add one to the casting rolls for the bearer when they attempt to cast Soul Blast, Pale Doom, or any spells from the Law of the Mortar Sand. So how I'm looking at this, again, the minus one is useful in case it gets attacked into combat. This is the most fighty one out of the Soul Masons, but that's nothing again to. As essentially how I mentioned it in the lore, is that the Soul Mason looks to see what souls need to be reaped, which are the best ones to take. The Soul Reaper, then the combat variation, wipes those souls from them by scything them from their bodies, and then the Bone Shaper is the guy who makes the contracts for the souls to be placed into. So that's how they work, so no surprise, like I said, that this is the more combat one, but he's not really that great at combat. So what you're looking at here is just adding one to your casting rolls, which is never bad. And then you've got Vial of Binding. So... This elongated vial is able to pluck the soul from an enemy at range, slaying them with a single sucking draught of negative energy. So once per battle in your hero phase, pick one enemy model within 12 inch of the bearer that is visible to them and roll a dice. If the roll is equal to or greater than that model's wounds characteristic, that enemy model is slain. Okay, so the first thing you think when you do this, you think of an enemy hero you want to kill, spike wound, you know, oh, you could wipe it on a shot. Yeah, you could, but, you know, at least it's equal to and you don't need to beat it. But it's once per battle, and let's say you try and wipe out that enemy hero and then you just roll a three, and it's like, oh, okay. You know, that, that's, that's it, right, basically. But it can be used to try and break enemy coherency, to try and make half the unit go away on Battleshock, or that sort of thing. You can use it to take out like banners or, you know, champions and units. So it has got some play. Or even you just use it to take out like a two wound model or something, which is like the uh, special weapon of a unit could be useful. And the number three, we have Guardians Reeve Soul. So this artifact contains a spirit that is kept in a state of permanent anguish, forcing it to intercede with its own torment of spiritual energy 
whenever the bearer is threatened. The Deathless Warrior's battle trait negates a wound or mortal wound allocated to the bearer on the roll of 5 instead of a 6. Instead of rolling the dice, you can say that the bearer will shatter this artifact. If you do so, the wound or mortal wound is negated without a dice being rolled. But this artifact cannot be used again for the rest of the battle. So looking at that, uh, the wound or mortal wound is negated. It's not wounds or mortal wounds. So you can't just go, oh, I've just taken loads of damage. Boom, not going to take it. There we go. Once per battle, gone. It's just for one of those wounds. So unless like this guy's got one wound left, they go, oh, I just need a six to save this, and you fail that six. Oh, one more damage, you're dead. And then you can go, ha ha, I'm not, because I've done this. Uh, yeah, not a massive fan. There's so many ways to make like individual characters have a five up, like, you know, Deathless Warriors save rather than a six up in this book. I don't know why they really leaned into that, but that's something they did. Um, and the best version of that is, like we said, from the Bone Shaver, what you can do by picking a unit that can have it. Um, so yeah... I mean, I'm not a massive fan of that. So my favourite out of the Soul Reaper ones are going to be the first one, the Luma Scythe, because, again, it's not just a simple plus one to your casting, because it's not as simple as that, as it's not going to help you for plus one to Arcane Bolt, Mystic Shield, etc., because it's only for the spell you got from the Law of the Mortar Sands, which we'll get to in a moment, and to only really help you with the spells that you can cast yourself, which is true, but... It's generally good to get that plus one. And then that's for track one from hit rolls. Might not seem like a lot. It's absolutely huge. Like, I wasn't playing Ostrich Bone Reapers, but I was in a tournament where I had a Chaos Law and Demonic Mount, and I had an Artifact Rim, made a minus one to hit in melee weapons. And it was just like, yeah, you know, it may be useful. We'll see. And then it turns out that it saved his skin so many times. But what I would also say is this is subtract one for hit rolls that target the bearer. That can also be for missiles. So you can get Lookout Sir and this to make the enemy minus two to him. So you can really have some play here. What I sometimes have used the um, Soul Reaper for is being the one who casts the Endless Spells. Because by casting the Endless Spell, you're then minus one to cast. So what that means is that you're not very really good to cast Rescue Spells. For If you take Arkham, for example, who's a multi-spell caster and casts three spells, you get him to cast your Endless Spells. Then when he tries to cast the next two spells, it's going to be minus one to cast, right? So, However, if you put it on the Soul Reaper instead, you're not really too fussed about, that's cool. But those Ender Spells you've got, those predatory Spells, will die because they're soul linked to him if he dies. They make this harder for the enemy to try and snipe him out and try and kill him. So yeah, I do like the Luma Scythe. That's my favourite out of the three for the Soul Reaper. So what are my favourite artefacts just in general? So my favourite one is going to be the Helm of the Ordained, which is the one to get the extra ones to hit for friendly units holding within 12 inches of that Liege Kavios. And then it's going to be the load of saturation, which was from the Mortis and Bone Shaper, to be able to give that Deathless Warriors a 5 up instead of a 6 up for a friendly unit that is within 1 inch of him. You know, you can just pick it. And then my third one is going to be the Mind Blade for the Liege Caveos, which was to try and make an enemy lose a command point and also make that hero not be able to do a command abilities for the rest of the battle. I think it'd be really good fun. So those are my three favourites out of all the artefacts you can choose from from this book that aren't part of a sub-allegiance. And then the last thing we're going to have a look at is going to be the spell law, which is the law of the mortar sands. And I said the last thing, I know I said I was going to have a look at the end of spells, but I reckon by the time I've gone through the spell law, the video's gone on for about an hour, so I think I am going to leave the end of spells like I usually do in a separate video, and I'll probably talk about them when I talk about the terrain feature later on in this series, so it's like a more dedicated video for that, rather than me just going like, oh, just a quick look at it, because I'm getting to the end of the video now, and I won't give it as much time. Like I say, I want to look at things in depth, so we'll do that in a separate video. If you want to have my overall thoughts about them, I think that they're good. I think points-wise at the moment, pretty cheap and they are worth the cost of being soul linked it's a good trade-off and you can do some very good things with them they have think they all have place that's my sort of overall thoughts but waiting for my full review for that but anyway going on with the spell law so you can choose or roll for one of the following spells for each mortisan in an ostrich bone reaper army here's the important bit nagash and arkan know all the spells from the law of mortisans and that makes nagash obviously really good but arkan who is like a cheap version of Nagash and a very cheap version of Nagash compared to Nagash's points. A more playable guy, I would say, in the Ostrich Bone Reapers. Don't get me wrong, people have done really well with Nagash. And obviously, I want Nagash to do well. You know, here, sitting as Agent Nagash, I do want him to do very well. But for my uh, sense of view, Arkan has done the best for me because I can really make the most of the rest of my army because he's not costing me so dear. 
Right, and then going into the Lord Mortal Sands, spell number one is Arcane Command. So this wizard sends a simulacrum to issue command to one of their subordinates. So Arcane Command is cast in raid five. If successfully cast, you receive D3 Relentless Discipline points. So this is one of my go-to ones. Again, like I say, I often take Arcan, so I can just do whatever ones I want, so I don't have to pick. But even if I don't take Arcan, I just take normal wizards. I do always pick this one because having that extra D3 Relentless Discipline points, which could be in each battle round because obviously you cast it in your hero phase, can really make a huge difference in your strategy of what you're able to do and not able to do with the rest of your army. So I really do find that useful. Again, cast away five is very low. Arcan's casting it, he only needs a three, as bear in mind he's getting that plus two to cast from his, like I said, these undamaged war scroll or isn't soul linked, whatever. Nagash casting it on a two, right? So it's a very, very good spell and it's not hard to get off. Number two, we have Empowered Nagarite Weapons. So the caster imbues Nagarite weapons with deadly power. And this is one, I'm just going to tell you straight away, that I always take as well if I can. So this is going to be Empowered Nagarite Weapons, cast some value of five. If successfully cast, pick one for any Elstrich Bone Reaper unit with the Nagarite Weapons ability. If you're wondering what that is, that's simply your Mortec Guard and your Kavalos Death Riders. If they get a six to hit, the six hit roll explodes into two wound rolls. We've seen it a lot repeat in Age of Sigma, and that's what the Bone Reapers have, and that is why this is good, because you pick one of those units that is wholly within 24 inches of the cast and is visible to them until the start of your next hero phase. That unit's Nagarite Weapons ability causes two hits to be scored on the unmodified hit roll of a five instead of a six, or on a four plus instead of a six, for a charging Kavalos Death Rider unit attacking with Nagarite Spears. A little bit different there, we'll get to that later. But for most things, it means you're going to be doing it on a 5 instead of a 6, which makes a huge difference. You can really increase your ways to be able to hit with your Shrek Bone Reapers, and you can get that reroll ones to hit, obviously, as well. It can just make things blow up, in my experience, especially when I put it on Death Riders, for example, but even with just the swords and not the spears, and it's still, they've just gone charging off, and they've gone boom. They've got that extra attack from the Leech Caviar, and it just really, really helps. And it's cast in value 5, so, you know, incredibly low cast in value. Uh, really, really low, and yeah, I really like it. Empowered Dangerite Weapons. And then number three, we have Protection of the Gash. So a barrier of nullifying energy shields the wizard from harm and transports them to safety if it is breached. So Protection of the Gash cast in value 6. If successfully cast, roll a dice each time a wound or mortal wound is allocated to the caster. On a 5+, plus, the wound or mortal wound is negated. If any wounds or mortal wounds are allocated to the caster and not negated, and the caster is not slain, remove them from the battlefield after all the wounds or mortal wounds have been allocated. Then set them up anywhere on the battlefield more than 9 inches from any enemy units. After setting up the model, this spell is unbound. Okay, so this spell is good, but I have had times when it's hurt me, and that's because I've had it where... For example, both my occasions are on Arcan, the uh, black, and the reason why that is, why it's been good and gone bad, is because I've used it when the enemies attacked me, they're stuck in combat with me, they had to, and then it made me take some damage, and then I teleported to an undefended enemy objective and was able to take it that turn. That is where it's been useful for me. It's like your way to be able to teleport in your army. It's, unless there's anything else I can't think of, it's your only way to be able to teleport in an Oshrach Bone Reaper army, and it's unreliable, but it's still important, and it's still key. And that's why, like I say, I like to take Arcan, it's just the option to cast it. So that was good, I managed to take an own objective. When it hasn't been good for me, is like more recently, I was against Idenef Deepkin in a tournament, and what happened is that I had Arcan on an objective, he got charged by an Eidolon, Arcan had the spell on him to try and make himself more survivable, but the problem what happened is that the Eidolon didn't manage to kill Arcan, but managed to cause a wound to him. So Arcan then had to teleport off my objective and somewhere else on the board. And what that meant is I ended up surrendering my objective to my opponent without a choice. Because it's not like uh, you then can teleport where you have to. So just be careful with this and just think about the long game of what could happen. Potential bad outcomes rather than just going, oh, I've got a five up more wound save, you know. Do think a little bit more about it. Again, you know, if you like, just put it on Arcan just to make him, or you know, any of these wizards that have cast it upon themselves, just to say, in case they take some shooting, you know, to avoid some of that damage. Again, you know, if they get shot 
and then they have to teleport. There's no enemy units within nine inches of where they currently stand. They can just stay where they are. They just then have the spell unbound. So it can be have a more mundane effect, I would say. And then going on to number four, we have reinforced battle shields. So the caster imbues the battle shields carried by Ostrich Bone Reaper warriors with arcane protective energy. Reinforced battle shields has a casting value of six. It successfully cast pick one from the Ostrich Bone Reaper unit armed with a shield or Nagarite battle shields that is wholly within 24 inches of the caster and is visible to them. Until the start of your next hero phase, roll a dice each time you allocate a mortal wound to that unit on a 5 plus that mortal wound is negated. So this is just against mortal wounds. It's not to just help you with wounds in general because a 5 up wound save and mortal wound save is very good, right? We've seen that a lot by like increasing the death as warriors ability. You know, the bone chamber can do it essentially of that artifact. But this is just a mortal wound. So bear in mind you've got that 6 up mortal wound save anyway, unless you're out of range or you're one of your units that would give you that benefit. So but a, a 5 up mortal wound save is good, especially when you've got like a big block of mortar guarding like, ah, oh, no one can kill me. And then the enemy just chucks a shitload of mortal wounds at you. You melt really quickly. So this is a good way to help that. Also for things like your mortis guard or even your liege caviosis or even like Xantos, right, can have this on them. So it can be very useful there. It's just a general good useful spell. And then you've got number five, Drain Vitality. So this cursed spell saps a foe's strength, leaving them weak and vulnerable. Drain Vitality is cast on their six. A successfully cast pick one enemy unit within eight inches of the caster that is visible to them. Until your next hero phase, re-roll unmodified hit rolls of six for attacks made by that unit and re-roll unmodified save rolls for that unit of a six for attacks that target it. Okay, so... That is really good and I really like that because it's not just for melee weapons as well. So you can really hurt a shooting unit of this because you've got a long range of 18 inches. And it's really good if you're going to go into something and you're like, right, I just want it to fail its saves. Let's say you're, you're chucking something out with minus two rend as well. So it's like it's only saving on a six as an example. I want them to reroll the save roll so I kill it. And even if they don't kill whatever I'm trying to kill, then at least any sixes what that unit gets the hit are going to be have to re rerolled. So it's helped me out more times than I can count when I really need it just to really make sure an enemy unit has no chance of doing what it wanted to do and for me to achieve my dreams and goals. Right and then the last one number six is mortal contract. So the caster binds an enemy unit to a deadly mystical contract. So mortal contract is custom base seven. It successfully cast pick one enemy unit within eight inches of the caster that is visible to them and for the rest of the battle, roll a dice at the end of each phase during which any attacks made by that unit inflicted any damage on a friendly Ostrich Bone Reaper unit. So that's just any unit in your army. On a 3+, the enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. You cannot pick the same unit to be affected by this spell more than once per hero phase. So this is really good. I really like it. It's rest of the battle as well. So it's really useful they're probably going to be doing damage against you especially if, depending on the unit you picked good range for it and there's a good chance they're going to take that d3 mortal wounds it's not like on a five up they'll take the d3 mortal wounds no on a three up it's fairly reliable and it's not just once per battle it will happen so i do like that as well again cast base seven but there are ways to get pluses to cast that we've already talked about depending on who you take and really that goes into what i want to say now all these spells are really really good in my personal opinion depending on the situation but they're not all good all the time. And that is why I really like to take Arcan, like I said, because I can just choose which spells I need to do when, and he gets the pluses to the cast, and he can increase the range of those spells as well with his command ability and being the first of the Mortarks, which then means that a lot of these 18 inch range spells are now 24 inches, which make a huge difference. Yeah, I really like that. Um, that's why, like I say, I take Arcan because I think he can do really well. Obviously, the Gash as well is going to be useful for these. But if you don't take those, so you're going to have to start picking, right? What are the best ones? So I really like Arcane Command to get those extra Relentless Discipline points. If you haven't got Arcane as an example, you've probably got more invested into the rest of your army. So you really want to make the most of those Relentless Discipline points. So I like Arcane Command. I also like Empowered Nagarite Weapons, as I think that's really good. The protection of the Gash is good, but it's not reliable enough to use as a teleport. And then you've got the Reinforce Battle Shield that are great to try and make you more survivable against mortal wounds. Those would be my top three. Again, the other three are still good, but those would be my top three I would go for. Arcane Command, Empower Nagarite Weapons, 
and then the reinforce battle shields. And with the spell lore done, that brings us to the end of the video. So like I say, I'm going to look at the endless spells and the scenery piece, the Bone Tide Nexus, in a separate video later down the line to really give them the attention they need rather than just whacking them on at the end of this one. So what I will say, guys, is I hope you really enjoyed the video. I hope you found something out in this video that's going to help you in your games to come, or maybe you learned something. If there's anything that you want to add to what I've said here, please put it down in the comments because it's great for us all to learn from each other. If there's anything you think that I've said wrong or you disagreed with, put that down below as well because it's great to learn from yourself as well if you think you've got experience of why something could be used better. And also, if you are new to the army or just new in general or just typically have a question about the Ostrich Bone Reapers, put that down below in the comments as well and I'll be happy to help you out best I can. And what I will say, guys, if you did enjoy this video, please smash that like button, that subscribe button, and that bell notification button if you haven't already. Those are just free clicks you can do within three seconds, and that is a fantastic way for you to show me that you really enjoy the content. It also helps out the channel as well on YouTube with algorithm, and also it shows me that you're enjoying, in this case, Osiris Bone Reaper content. As I always say, I will be aiming my content towards what is more popular for you guys as I make this for you guys. So if something doesn't get too many likes, I tend to not really come back to it. So make sure you smash that like button if you enjoyed it. What I would also like to do is now say a massive shout out to my patrons who are, as I mentioned at the start of the video, the lifeblood of my channel. So first looking at the fantastic Morgar. So this is going to be the wonderful Sandback, the glorious Jonathan H, and the brilliant Philco, followed by the magnificent Bleed Red. Again, guys, of that tier, thank you so much for your unequaled generosity. And then going on to my vampires, who again do a great job. Thanks a lot, guys. It's going to be Mir, Martinez, Rouse321, David A, and Ronnie H. Thank you so much. And then, of course, my Necromancers, which is Jack L, Radiation Riley, AW77, Dice Sagas, Wolfnick, Michael W, Quad, Cranky Wombat, Christopher F and Christopher C. Again, guys, thank you so much for your continued help there. It really does make a difference. So what I also want to say, if you'd like to become a patron, please consider going to my Patreon page, which you'll be able to find a link for at the top of the description down below. Even if you just consider giving $1 a month, guys, it really does help. It keeps the channel going purely because it helps fund in towards things like I'm talking to you now on a microphone I bought for the channel, editing software, buying bathrooms to be able to do these readings and everything else, and just things for me to be able to justify putting this much time into the channel. It really goes to help all that, and I really am thankful for anything you can give. But if you can't give anything, no worries at all, guys. And if you did enjoy the video, just press those three buttons, and that will do a wonderful job in itself, that like, subscribe, and notification button and anything you want help with down below to do with the Ostrich Bone Reapers or any questions you've got with them, please put them in the comments and I'll be happy to help you best I can, like I said. So with that, guys, that is part one of our Ostrich Bone Reaper series done. Of course, we looked at the lore last time. This is the part one of the rules that we get into, as if you guys have been around for a while now, you would have seen with my other videos, like, I don't know, the Beast of Chaos one, and then, like, the Slaves of Darkness or the recent ones. So the next one we're going to look at is all going to be about the sub allegiances. So we did mention them a couple of times, but we're actually going to take full in-depth look at them in the next video. So I hope you guys stick around for that. However, in the meantime, if you are watching this, like, Premier Now, if you would like some more info on the Ostrich Brain Reapers, I have done a load of lore for them, so you can go check that out. But I've actually done, like I mentioned, a Y play video for them, and I've actually done a how to start collecting video for them. If you're going, right, this is the armor for me, I'm all pumped, all excited, how do I start? Go check out that video, and it should help you out with that process. But with that aside, guys, I just want to say again, thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember until next time to wear a mask, wash your hands and stay hygienic for God's sake so we can all start playing our Ostrich Bone Reaper army soon. And more importantly though than any of that is remember until next time that Nagash is all and all is one in Nagash.